Welcome. Hello, everybody. I'm Jessica Deruzza from Trust Psyche, and it is such a pleasure to be able to spend this Sunday together. This is our free monthly Trust Psyche live stream that we host right here every first Sunday of the month. All are welcome, so please invite your friends. We host a variety of speakers on a myriad of topics, and you can find out more about us at trustpsyche.com, and you can sign up for these live streams at trustpsyche.com backslash live stream to participate live and to ask your questions. If you value what we do here today, the best way you can support us is by subscribing to our YouTube channel, liking this video, and sharing it with all of your friends. I'm very honored and excited to present our guest speaker for today, Chris Beish, who's going to be presenting on his forthcoming book, LSD and the Mind of the Universe, Diamonds from Heaven, released this November 26. You can pre-order your copy today through Amazon. Up until the 1700s, humans believed that the edge of our universe ended at the planet Saturn the last visible planet that we can see with the unaided eye. With the invention of the telescope, we turned it to the heavens, and to our great surprise, we discovered the planet Uranus, twice as far out as the planet Saturn. Our universe doubled in size. Then, in the 1800s, with the discovery of Neptune, our universe once again doubled in size. Then, in 1931, with the discovery of Pluto, our universe then again doubled in size. And now, less than 400 years later from the discovery of Uranus, we have the Deep Space Hubble Telescope, which shows us that there are trillions upon trillions of galaxies in our universe. For me, this is analogous to the work that Chris has done in his deep exploration of consciousness, radically breaking open and through our cosmology and our philosophy and our metaphysics through the 73 high dose LSD sessions that he did over 20 years and began to share with us in his work, Dark Night, Early Dawn, Steps to a Deep Ecology of Mind. Now with LSD and the mind of the universe, Chris takes us further into diamond luminosity and brings back the diamonds from heaven that he so graciously shares with all of us here today. There couldn't be a more important time for Chris to share his work with all of us, both in the greater understanding and acceptance of psychedelics today, but also because of the psycho-spiritual death and rebirth that our collective human species seems to be going through right now. So please help me give a very warm and loving welcome to our beloved friend, Chris Beish. And when Chris is done speaking, you each have an opportunity to ask your questions, so please have those ready, as that is our favorite and most special part of these live streams. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Je Jessica and Travis. Thank you for this opportunity to share my work with the uh, participants in TrustPsyche.com. It is truly an honor to do so. It's also an overwhelming task because this book covers so many dimensions of consciousness. It covers so many years of work. And when I talk about it, I have a tendency to get absorbed naturally into the experiences I'm describing. And that makes compressing 20 years of work and 20 years of thinking and writing into a very short presentation really challenging. So to me, a talk is the most effective way to get to question and answers. So I'll try to keep this contained and as brief as I can, and then save a good half hour at the end for Q&A, and we'll see where that goes, maybe even more than a half an hour. So I'm going to start with, uh, well, a little bit of background, first of all. Those of you who know me, some who don't know me, I'm the last person you would expect to have written a book on psychedelics. I was raised in the Deep South in Mississippi, I was raised in a middle-class Catholic background. I wanted to be a, a priest early in my life, was in the seminary for three years in high school. I studied theology at Notre Dame, New Testament criticism at Cambridge, and then philosophy of religion at Brown. 
By the time I had finished graduate school, I was an atheistically inclined agnostic. And the 60s had completely passed me by. I was not psychedelically involved in, uh, in my college or graduate school at all. So I was naive psychedelically, and I was atheistically inclined agnostic philosophically. And then came LSD. Shortly after beginning my career, I met the work of Stan Groff, and that set my life on a course uh, that I'm still harvesting today. So first, let me start a PowerPoint that I'll be using, and then I'm gonna keep this on only for about 10 minutes, and then I'll shift in and out of it again later. Let me see if I can get this started here. This is what the book will look like, and I'll tell you a secret about this book. This is the uh, publisher's title, LSD and the Mind of the Universe. My title is Diamonds from Heaven, because Diamonds from Heaven is a story of a journey. But they wanted uh, a more marketable title, and that's LSD and the Mind of the Universe. The beginning of this book goes back 40 years, over 40 years, when I had begun graduate school in 78. Right then, I met the work of Stanislav Grof, his book, Realms of the Human Unconscious, Turned My Life Around, followed quickly by LSD psychotherapy. He gave me the method and the confidence to pursue the method of exploring my consciousness and through that exploration to come to know the deep psyche, the deep universe, better. I want to emphasize that I did this work as a philosopher. I was not a therapist. I was not primarily seeking healing, though healing did come but I was seeking to understand our universe as deeply as I could by exploring my consciousness as deeply as I could. So a few observations on method, and then we'll kind of go right into the content. Everyone is aware, I think, of the distinction between low-dose psycholytic therapy that Stan develops and high-dose psychedelic therapy. Low-dose psychedelic therapy peels the mind gradually layer by layer, in very intense therapeutic encounters. Psychedelic therapy is a very different protocol. It's a protocol trying to trigger, in the early days, we're trying to trigger a near-death experience for people who had terminal cancer. They weren't trying to heal them, but to trigger an encounter with the universe that would open them to the world that they were about to enter. When I began my own work, I chose to work with high doses of LSD, primarily because it was simply difficult to get time to arrange a day of inner journeying with a dual career marriage, and I wanted to make the most out of every day that I could put into this. I thought of myself as basically doing an extended regimen of psychedelic therapy, doing just psychedelic therapy, but for a longer period of time. Originally, psychedelic therapy was limited to a maximum of three sessions. And I thought, well, if you could do three sessions with this work safely, you could do it more sessions and do it safely. When I got to the end of this journey and was looking back over its length, I began to appreciate that what happened in my work was different than what I saw being recorded, reported in psychedelic therapy. So different that I thought it needed a new kind of language to describe it. So I've chosen the term psychedelic exploration. Psychedelic exploration is the method of psychedelic therapy. Isolation, earphones, head, headphones, music, uh, total protection with a sitter. The difference is the number of sessions involved. Uh, in my case, 73 high-dose sessions between 1979 and 1999. I worked for four years. I stopped for six years for reasons that I describe in the book, and then I resumed for a very intense 10-year process. I did this work between when I was 30 and 50 years old. I'm now 70 years old, so I've taken a long time to present this work completely candidly to the world, partly for legal reasons, and partly because it simply takes a long time it took me a long time to map and understand all the dynamics of the sessions that unfolded during these years. Um, I want to say at the outset that this is not a methodology that I would recommend today. If I were doing it over again, I would be gentler on myself. 
I would take a slower process of engaging the great expanse of the mind of the universe. I would balance high dose work with low dose sessions. I would also balance working with LSD with working with psilocybin and ayahuasca, more body grounded psychedelics. For a variety of reasons, all of which I discuss in the book, don't have time to go into here. I tried to do this work as systematically and rigorously as I can. Working as a philosopher, I made it a high priority to make a complete and phenomenologically accurate record of my sessions within 24 hours, and then study the sessions and the dynamics arcing across sessions and comparing my experiences to those who were, that had been had by other psychedelic journeyers. This is a snapshot of my journal, about 400 pages of my psychedelic notes uh, that for me are my personal Bible. They are the record of my deepest experiences of the universe and therefore in my life they come before all other discursive thinking and uh, analytic analysis. Kept detailed records of my sessions all the way through I looked at and studied the astrological transits of my sessions, uh, trying, I was aware of Rick and Stan's thinking about the relationship between the outer transits, the outer planets and the global transits and how they affect one's work in deep non-ordinary states. So I wanted to study this hypothesis myself and uh, look at how my sessions projected against the rhythms of the solar system during the years I was doing this work. I want to emphasize that the story I'm telling in LSD and the Mind of the Universe is not primarily a personal story. I mean, it is a personal story at one level, but in another sense, it's not primarily a personal story. This series of curves represents a series of LSD sessions. And I found that after the first 15 sessions or so, when I was working, insights and help in my personal life tended to come at the beginning and end of my sessions as I was leaving and returning to time-space reality. That's reflected in these small circles. When the session was in its peak hours, represented by the large circles, I was usually operating beyond pers my personal reality, beyond Crispacious reality. Not entirely, but largely. And so the story I'm telling in LSD and the Mind of the Universe is the story of what unfolded in those large circles at the peak hours of my psychedelic sessions. This is primarily a cosmological narrative. It's not primarily a therapeutic narrative. The details, the personal details are important in a therapeutic narrative, not so much in a cosmological narrative. I found when I did this work, that what unfolded in my work was a series, a multiple series of experiences of death and rebirth that I eventually kind of concretized into this picture. The drop below the line, that line is kind of represents the border of time space. The drop below the line is egoic reality, our individual space time consciousness. And the first death and rebirth which is the one most frequently talked about in the literature, is ego death, which takes place in that first level, when we make the transition from ordinary consciousness into early transpersonal consciousness. But if you continue to work and press the limits of your experience, I found that there are other deaths which take place at other levels of consciousness. Now I follow Stan Groff in using the vocabulary of psychic, subtle, and causal reality to describe some of these deeper levels of consciousness. I don't have a vested interest in how many levels of reality there might be or how many times a circle of death and rebirth may turn. Um, what's important is the principle that if, as one pushes deeper and deeper and deeper, if you do this work systematically, there are a series of deaths and rebirths that open in the process. As I have looked back and mapped, oh, these circles oversimplify, of course. These are a number of sessions, and what is shown here is the sort of circles within circles, the deaths within deaths 
that mark a, a deepening, a progressive deepening into causal level reality. So, yeah, circles within circles. When I looked over the entirety of all of my psychedelic work, I identified five fundamental death rebirth processes or levels of consciousness where death and rebirth were operating. These are the five levels. First, the death of self, by which I mean the death of our time-space identity as our individual identity, as our sense of who and what we are. Moving into collective mind, there are three chapters in the book dealing with the dynamics of collective mind, the ocean of suffering, deep time. Then archetypal mind, experiences at the high archetypal level, experience at the, at the lower archetypal level. Followed by immersion in causal oneness. Oneness services, of course, much earlier in the sequence, but there is something quite distinctive about causal level oneness. And finally, the diamond luminosity work. After everything that had taken place before, emer merging into uh, the diamond light that Buddhism calls Dharmakaya, I call the diamond luminosity. So let me, before turning off the PowerPoint, let me simply take you through a list of the chapters of LSD and the Mind of the Universe. There's a methodology chapter, chapter one, but then in terms of the content of the experiences, crossing the boundary of birth and death, the ocean of suffering, deep time and the soul, initiation into the universe, the greater real of archetypal reality, a benediction of blessings, the birth of the future human, diamond luminosity, and final vision. And then there is the last chapter, coming off the mountain. It took me actually a year just to write that last chapter. That is a chapter in which I reflect on what has been happening in my life in the 20 years after I stopped my psychedelic work. What I'll do is go through each of these chapters and simply mention a few points on each of the chapters, work through the list as quickly as I can, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions and answers. Let me keep track of my time, okay. First, crossing the boundary of life and death is the one that's easiest because it's most familiar. It's so thoroughly described in Stan Groff's literature. Uh, when I entered this domain, which took about two and a half years to navigate and 10 sessions, my work began saturated, became saturated with confrontations with death, fetal sensations, all sorts of severe perinatal seizures, a purging of the body, eventually culminating in ego death. My ego death basically involved a complete reversal of everything that I knew myself to be at the time. I was an academic, a white male academic, uh, a philosopher, passionately concerned with the meaning of life. I became the complete opposite of that. I became women, women of color, women who were not interested in philosophical reflection at all. I became, it, it was a frightening experience, a terrifying experience. But when I let go, when I let go and allowed myself to become all these women who were so different from me, I entered the world of women and was given the experience of hundreds and hundreds of women under the arm of the Great Mother. It was a truly life-changing experience for me, and I wish every man could have that experience. When I went into, when I went through that death and rebirth process, and went into continued to work, I entered into a domain of suffering and pain and agony, collective pain and suffering that was so severe, I came to call it the ocean of suffering. So let me back up just for a second. Working at these levels, as I did it, every session basically had two phases. 
a first phase, which was a purification phase, and a second phase, which was the ecstatic phase. The purification phase would be some type of very profound cathartic uh, purification engagement. And if that was allowed to continue to its culmination, there was some type of crescendo, a breakthrough, and then the session pivoted to an ecstatic portion for the remainder of the session. When I'm describing the ocean of suffering, I'm describing the purification phase of the next two years of work. Tremendous suffering. Um, at first I thought this was a, a deepening of ego death. I thought somehow that pieces of my ego were still in play and that this collective suffering represented a deepening of ego death. But eventually this continued for so long and it was so severe that I came to a different conclusion. The conclusion I came to is that somewhere along the line, something had happened in my sessions that these ordeals were not really aimed at my personal transformation at all. That somewhere along the line, the focus of my work at this point became actually the purification and healing of some aspect of the collective psyche, some aspect of the collective unconscious that somehow I was tapping into pain and suffering which was lodged in the collective psyche. And by engaging this pain and suffering consciously, it was in some way being lifted out of the collective psyche and therefore lightening the kind of karmic burden that our species was holding. When I wrote Dark Night, Early Dawn, primarily to understand this whole dynamic, primarily to understand how my sessions, how death could become as large as it became in my sessions. And by integrating Rupert Sheldrake's concept of morphic fields into Stan Grof's paradigm, the way open to viewing these experiences as part of a larger transformational practice aimed at the collective psyche. In the ecstatic portion of these next these two years of sessions, in the ecstatic portion, I entered into what I call deep time in the soul. I, ent I began to have experiences of my life as a completed whole from start to finish, with all the time moments of my life, with all the themes and all the people and circumstances of my life simultaneously present. And I was basically taken into this territory consistently for one year, over and over again, seven sessions, went deeper and deeper, and was basically given a profound crash course in Chris Beige's life, what it was about, who the people were that I was involved in. I, my life was taken into a kind of a, a, a spiritual distillation of what my life was about and what it was going to be about. When I first entered this reality and came out of it after the session, it had been the most powerful and transformative experience of my life, and yet I couldn't remember it. After the session was over, I could not hold on to transtemporal experiences of this magnitude because there simply was no reference point in my ordinary consciousness to anchor them. But when I went back again and again and again, I found that I was able to hold on to these experiences more effectively. I was able to remember them. I was able to bring more and more of them back. And this is an important point. If you want to enter into these states and cultivate systematic recall of the experiences in these states, you have to really work with a lot of discipline. You have to engage them very conscientiously, record them conscientiously, and if you hold this position well, you literally learn how to become, how to be, stay conscious in states of consciousness that previously you were not able to hold conscious awareness in. And this pattern repeated, every time I would break through to a new level, there was always a period of disorientation, a period of loss of memory, but then when I would keep going back over and over and over again, to that new level, my cognition improved, my perception improved, my ability to understand and record all the experiences improved. Now, the ocean of suffering work, I said, lasted two years and uh, 14 sessions, but this was actually divided 
into a one year of work, and then I took my six year break, and then I started my psychedelic work again. When I started after my six year break, the ocean of suffering began exactly where it had been in the first year of work. So six years later, completely different circumstances in my life, completely different expectations, and different astrological conditions. Nevertheless, my sessions began exactly where they had stopped, which is an indication of the, the intentionality of the intelligence that's guiding our work. When I started this after the break, the ecstatic portion of the sessions began at a completely different place. The ecstatic portion of the sessions began in what I came to call an initiation into the universe. I was taken systematically by some intelligence that never adopted any form, but I always felt an intelligence that seemed to be intent on teaching me how the universe functions, how it operates. I was given a crash course in Cosmology 101. In this material, the initiation of the universe, I should mention, I give names to my sessions. I give every session a name. The name reflects the pith content of the session, and I break the session down in bullet points. The names of the sessions that I gave this chapter on initiation of the universe, these are the sessions that are discussed in that chapter. You and I creating was really a crash course in cosmology. The cosmic tour was an extraordinary tour of the universe. Then there was a training session that I called the Council of Elders, a, a session which was training me on how to maintain coherent consciousness as these deeper levels of awareness were opening. Dying into oneness was an extraordinary immersion into uh, oneness. The master plan was the beginning of a series of visions that I'm going to come back to later. It was a series of initiations into what appeared to be the plan that the creative intelligence had for the evolution of the human species at this point in its history. I know it sounds monstrously arrogant to talk like that, but this is simply what happened in the sessions. And then healing the collective wound. Healing the collective wound was the ocean of suffering came into a culmination. It, it came into an extraordinary, uh, hard to describe, I lay it out in the book as best as I can, hard to describe the magnitudes of suffering that one can enter into in this work. And when that work came to its crescendo, I was spun from there into archetypal reality, and the ocean of suffering never returned in future sessions. There was a lot of work, there was suffering, but it was never this collective suffering that seemed to reflect the history of the human species. After the initiation of the universe, I entered archetypal reality. This lasted about one and a half years and 11 sessions. When I entered archetypal reality, I entered a reality that immediately was recognized as more real than physical reality. Every time I entered this level of work, I, I had the sensation that as I was entering a reality that was more real, more existentially real than time and space. In fact, it became very disorienting to realize how diluted and watered down reality is inside time and space reality. When I entered this work, my human identity began to fall away from me. I found that we have a sense of being human that is deeper than our sense of being any individual human. An ego death is a death of our individual experience of being human. But entering archetypal reality required that I somehow let go of human experience at a deeper level. And eventually, I could no longer fit myself back into any cognitive frame of reference related to Homo sapiens. I entered a level of consciousness that I experienced as being above and beyond human consciousness. And there I was systematically worked with and given lessons on how reality operated there. These experiences kind of broke down in, at two different levels. At the high platonic level, at the high subtle level, 
I encountered beings that were completely beyond my ability to conceptualize and understand. My mind imaged them like galaxies. They were just vast beings that were the creators of time and space. They were the creators of life on this planet. They were the guardians of existence. They were the massive cons constitutional forces that actually create everything that we know as time and space in this magnificent universe. At a lower archetypal level, at more of a Jungian level, I was taken and given many experiences of the collective consciousness, our collective psyche, our collective unconscious, and even kind of a collective body that all of our bodies are cells in. I was given many experiences on how the collective psyche works, on how reality functions at this level. These all took place primarily at subtle level reality. So I was given exercises in the nuts and bolts of how reality works, how our individual minds are cells within a larger mind, and even how our individual bodies or cells within some kind of fundamental core archetype of the human body. And that when we engage and heal diseases in our individual body, we simultaneously are impacting the health of the human family's larger body. The list of the sessions that I address in this chapter The 28th session was an extraordinarily positive session, ec ecstatic session, in which I broke through and touched causal level reality for the first time. An extremely clear, lucid, hard to describe state of hyperclarity. And then I was quite surprised to go through three sessions of just gut wrenching uh, cleansing, just an ordeal of physical, psychological cleansing that had absolutely no cognitive content associated with it at all. It's just a, a, just a gut-wrenching cleansing. In time, to make a very long story short, I began to realize that what I, there is a cycle that I came to call the cycle of purification. The cycle of purification is that every step into a deeper level of consciousness is a step into a higher level of energy. So that when, we, when I first broke into causal level reality in the 28th session, I touched a reality that was so pure that it triggered a purification process in my being that lasted three sessions extending over six months. And I found that this pattern repeated itself over and over again as I continued to go deeper. Every time I broke into a new level of conscious and had that ecstatic experience of waking up in a deeper level of reality, the following sessions were very, very difficult, very much involved in cleansing, carrying out the garbage, uh, so much so that I began to dread the sessions that immediately followed the major breakthrough sessions. I should mention here that one of the things that opened up at this level is I began to experience reincarnation as a collective phenomenon. Previously, and those of you who know my book on reincarnation life cycles, know that the story of the soul, or the story I'm telling of reincarnation there is the story of our individual evolution, directing our individual evolution over many lifetimes, reflecting our individual choices and our individual learning. But now I began to have experiences of the entire planet entering into a, a reincarnation process. And I experienced billions of people over time, century after century, billions of people incarnating in a way that was integrated, that was not uniform, but that was integrated so that all of our individual karma, our individual soul aspirations, our individual challenges, we're all part of the collective karma, collective challenges, and our collective development as a species. It was magnificently beautiful to witness this interplay between individual and collective reincarnation. Again, all of these taking place at the subtle level of reality when one is gauging the deeper architecture 
of the universe. After spending about 11 months exploring archetypal reality and at going through this, 11 sessions, going through this very quickly, I entered what I came to call the benediction of blessings. It was a period of extraordinary blessings, just given one massive blessing after another. These are the names of the four sessions that I address in this chapter. The forest was an experience of shunyata, emptiness of self, no self in me, no self anywhere around me, a, a, an experience of radical and profound transparency. The birth of the diamond soul I'll mention in a second. Singing the universe away was an experience of primal void, an experience that culminated in the experience of Satchitananda, consciousness being in bliss, eventually moving into a complete void, the fertile void that subsumes and is the origin out of which the physical universe emerged. Jesus' blood was an experience of extraordinary cosmic love, love like I've never known it before, just super saturated, uh, soul saturated uh, engaging of love. The birth of Diamond Soul I want to mention because uh, it'll come up later in the work. In that experience, in the birth of the Diamond Soul session, which was really a, a deeply moving, long lasting session for me, I began to experience all of my former lives coming into me very fast, very quickly. 11 years before, I had experienced my entire life from beginning to end. Now I began to experience all my lives coming in and it was like the, we were wrapping kite string around a spool. And at some point this spool ignited. It, it, it was as if we hit critical mass and all of these lives fused into a singularity. And when they fused, an extraordinary light broke out of my chest. It was my first contact with what I later call diamond light. And I think what I was being given in this session was an experience of how reincarnation works and where reincarnation is taking humanity. This process of accumulating more and more experience, more and more lives, is not simply improving us and making us better beings one life at a time, adding a little bit here, a little bit there. But eventually we're collecting experience and I think eventually in the entire human saga, all of us are coming into a stage where eventually all of our knowledge, all of our experience, everything we've ever done, everyone we've ever known through these lives, there is a fusion of that knowledge. And when that knowledge fuses, we are catapulted into a, a higher operational status with a different relationship to the universe, a greater transparency to the universe, and also a different relationship with everyone around us. Because we have been connected to each other for so many lifetimes. We have been fathers, mothers, enemies, friends, partners in so many lifetimes. When we become whole within ourselves, it opens up a depth of compassion to all beings we experience around us, and not just human beings, all beings on our planet. After the benediction of blessings, where the work went next was into the diamond luminosity work. I was completely existentially satisfied after the, the uh, benediction of blessings work. I had given something that I had been asked to give in the ocean of suffering, and I had been repaid and given more in return than I could possibly have imagined. But then we went into the diamond luminosity work. But before I begin to tell you about that, I want to backstep a little bit and talk about the birth of the future human. Because it's been a reoccurring theme in my session, starting all the way back to the 22nd session, all the way through to the end of the sessions, a reoccurring theme is what is happening to the human race? Where are we in our evolutionary journey? Now, I tell this story in the book. I brought together in one place all of the session material related to 
the birth of the future human in this one chapter. So in the starting with experiences that first appeared in chapter six, the initiation of the universe, running all the way through, I gathered them all together and collected them into two segments. First is a segment that I call the visions of awakening, which are visions that I had been given in different piecemeal fashion about where we are and where we are going. Um, I break this down into six visions. These are the six themes of our awakening. What was most striking to me about this was first, how dramatic this process was and how the experience was that we were poised to move into an evolutionary, to make an evolutionary jump that would completely propel us into a higher order of functioning, not only as individuals, but as a species. We were poised on the edge of a profound great awakening. But in all of these visions, and I'm going so fast, I hate to go so fast through them, but in all of these visions, I, and which kept pointing to an awakening taking place on the planet of the human species, of the entire species, the consciousness of our universe was actually trying to awaken the entire human species. I was not shown how this was going to take place. I was not shown how this was even possible. And then about a year and a half after the last of the visions of awakening, I was given a session right in the middle of the diamond luminosity work. I had entered the diamond luminosity in sessions 45 and 50. I would enter it again later in sessions 60 and 66. Right in the middle, I was taken into the deep time of our species. So I was given an experience of take, being taken right into the center of the great awakening that we are coming into. And there I experience this transformation, not as an individual human being. My boundaries had been blown open so many times in the years preceding that I experienced the great awakening as our species. I was taken inside the collective psyche and was given an experience of what will be happening from the perspective of the collective unconscious. My experience there was that for there to be a great awakening of this magnitude, there must first take place a great death, a great surrender. We must be purged and emptied of all our old ways of thinking and feeling before the space is created to allow awakening of a higher order of knowing. So that the time of great awakening was preceded by a time of great breakdown, loss of control, literally an unraveling of life as we know it. Just as in a psychedelic session, one must let go of everything and experience a profound death before great visions open. Likewise, for our species, we must let go of everything that has dominated our past, all the constrictions of our thinking, the constrictions of our mind and the constrictions of our heart in order to open to this new future which is coming. There is a third segment on the birth of the future human and that came later in the chapter on the final vision. I want to say uh, that my visions didn't tell me how this was going to take place. It didn't tell me when it was going to take place. It didn't give me any information about the details. It took me inside the collective psyche and gave me an experience of the collective psyche's experience of this. And it also gave me an understanding and experience of some of the mechanisms that are involved at the collective level that will help us move, make this huge transition we are trying to make in the little time that we have to make it. I discussed this, I, I present this, I discussed it in Dark Night Early Dawn and I, I lay it out again in um, LSD in the Mind of the Universe. The diamond luminosity material. As I said before, after the benediction of blessings, I had no idea where the work was gonna go. I was completely existentially satisfied. I felt I had been drawn deep into the cosmic process. I had been 
overwhelmed with cosmic love. I've been taken into the fertile void underneath all physical existence. I had no idea where things would go, but there were still five years ahead on the journey. And the Diamond Luminosity covers four years of the work and 26 sessions. It by far covers more sessions than any other chapter in the book in a longer period of time. What happened was after going through yet one more very intense death and rebirth process, I was taken into a reality, a, a level of consciousness that was, well, Buddhism calls it Dharmakaya, the clear light of absolute, of absolute reality. I was taken in a domain of consciousness that was absolute pure light. The most striking thing about the experience was how clear, clear, clear beyond imagination this domain was. Just to touch this for a few minutes was life transforming in and of itself absolute clear clear beyond the species mind beyond archetypal reality beyond physical any derivative of physical consciousness into this hyper clear celestial state over the next four years i entered this reality four times and only four times out of 26 sessions only four of them took me deep into this reality here are the names of the sessions death state Diamond Luminosity, the Universal Field of Light, and the Nature of Mind. In between these sessions, as you might imagine, there were many sessions of continuing intense purification uh, because this was a deeper level of reality, a much more pure level of reality, and that required a purification of my physical and psychological system in order to stabilize consciousness at this reality. They also uh, scattered in these sessions, there was a great deal of personal healing that took place, which is kind of curious to me because I would have thought that personal healing would have taken place much earlier in the journey, but it took place here. Uh, and I discussed, I came to understand why things were unfolding in that order. The first two of these sessions were taking me deeper and deeper into Diamond Luminosity, which really peaked then in the 50th session. The second two sessions, 60 and 66, the Diamond Luminosity was crunching itself deeper and deeper into my physical system, into my psychological system, into my physical body. As I said, talking about these sessions, they're very powerful. They draw me into them just to try to describe that the time is short. So I want to move through and we'll keep going and we can come back to them in the question and answers. Let me mention one thing. Um, midway through this process, in the 50th session, when I went into the deepest transcendent experience I ever had in any of the sessions into the deepest level of diamond luminosity. I was as far into the crystalline body of God as I had ever been and would ever be. And right in the middle of this session, I had an experience that completely changed my understanding of existence. In the middle of this session, my visual field pivoted 90 degrees and I saw reality that was far beyond the reality that I was in, inside diamond luminosity. And a ray of light came out of that distant reality and hit me, and it completely shattered me. It just, I, just absolutely shattered me. And in that experience, I realized that there is no end to this journey. There is no destiny point and end point that one eventually reaches that the divine is infinite and will never ever, I will never ever be able to reach even using this powerful method to the absolute ends of that reality. Now, this is important because I had absorbed and many of us have absorbed the idea that there is an end point to this journey. You become one with God or you enter into the metacosmic void, that there is an end point and you keep pushing until you reach that end point. 
And I had experienced oneness with God, but I discovered that there are many permutations of oneness. There are levels and levels of oneness. And I had experienced the, the formless void, but I had learned that there are actually dimensions of formlessness. There are depths of formlessness. When, I, when the diamond luminosity work opened, I thought it, it came with such a profound sense of homecoming. It was so deeply satisfying. I thought I had finally found my destination. I had finally found my stopping point. I had found the end of the journey. And this session, session 50, showed me that there are dimensions beyond even that. And I would never, ever reach some final stand point. The reason that death kept returning over and over again in this work is if you keep driving yourself and you have a method that's sufficiently powerful to keep taking you past your then limits, the universe will keep taking you deeper and deeper and deeper into, yourself, into itself and will never be able to reach the very end of it. And that's why I would be gentler with myself if I were doing this work over again. Because now I understand that the goal was not to get to some end state or some ultimate dimension. The goal is to open ourselves to the transcendent realities and let as much of that spiritual reality into our hearts and into our minds, to let it change us down to the heart and soul and incorporate as much of it as we possibly can and bring as much of divinity into time and space as we possibly can and be patient with the rest. I'm a little more patient now than I was when I was a young man doing this work. And then this brings me to the final vision chapter, the chapter where well, I'm going to take a shortcut here. I'll simply say that I was put through a horrendously powerful strip down process and was taken deeper into deep time than I had ever been taken before. And I was given an extraordinarily powerful series of visions about human evolution and was allowed to experience again the future human that we are in the process of becoming, to experience the architecture, the inner architecture of the deep psyche of the future human. And this is a magnificent being. Just to, just to think about this being, just to remember the magnitude of this being brings tears to my eyes. It's so important for us to hold on to the vision of what we are, where we are going and what is happening in the deep structure of history because as the shadows of our travail deepen, as we enter the great time of unraveling, as we enter the purification that we are coming into now, it's going to be very tempting and there'll be all sorts of voices talking about Armageddon and apocalypse and the extinction and the end of times. And this is not the end of anything. This is the process of giving birth to a new and finer version of humanity. After this, the consciousness guiding my sessions uh, wrapped it up. I didn't know we were stopping, but it wrapped it up and took me through two experiences, which I call the goodbye sessions. It basically uh, wrapped up all of our work. And at the end of the 73rd session, I knew that it was time for me to stop. I want to talk about very briefly coming off the mountain. Overall, I think I did a good job integrating my sessions as I went. I paid a lot of attention to my body. I took good care of my body. I did a lot of spiritual practice. I wrote my sessions down carefully. I tried to internalize them as deeply as I could. Session by session, I think I did a good job of integrating my sessions. And because I had been given so many gifts and so many blessings in the course of my 20 years of work, I thought that I could simply stop my sessions and step back and I would continue to be nourished by those experiences. And I was, and that did happen, but that's not all that's happened. In the years following the ending of my work in 1999, I found myself gradually entering into a period of what I call the deep sadness, a profound existential sadness.
what I was suffering from was a loss of communion with the divine. I had entered so deeply into the divine, so deeply into the luminous reality of such supreme supercosmic reality that I knew I would never enter that deeply into reality, into the divinity again before I died. I knew I was going away, I was setting it aside and coming back and that for a variety of reasons, too much to go into here. I had to stop my sessions. It was important for me to stop them, but I knew I would never experience the divine this deeply again until I died. And I would experience it again when I died. But not being able to return this deeply into divinity became an open heartache for me. Once you have been, have known the joy of dissolving into the divine light, once you have dissolved completely into the boundaryless condition transcending time and space, life on earth can tend to feel kind of dried up. And basically I was losing interest in continuing to live inside time and space. Eventually I realized I was just waiting to die. I was taking care of my children, I was taking care of my students and teaching, writing, but in my heart of hearts, I was waiting to die so that I could return to my beloved, to the divine. And then years passed and I realized this is not right, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Everything about my life was screaming failure to integrate, but because I had tried to integrate each of my sessions so carefully and so conscientiously, I did not understand where the failure could lie, but I had no choice but to recognize that somewhere along the line, something had gone wrong, that it would leave me feeling so existentially adrift in its wake. So I turned and studied my work further to try to figure out what had gone wrong. And what I learned was Integrating an entire journey is different than integrating individual sessions. That basically, hard to talk about in a matter of seconds and a half a minute. Um, It's hard to describe the, the process of, in a sense, having too much God. It almost sounds like a contradiction in terms. Surely more of God is always better. Now this entire physical universe is the body of God. I, knew that I'm, I know that I'm standing here and surrounded and part of the body of the divinity. But even that knowledge which had been given me in my sessions did not save me from the consequences of having entered into full divine presence so many times. In time, I began to realize that I had lost a balance in my sessions, and the balance was between transcendence and imminence. I had entered so deeply into transcendent reality that I had lost my foothold in space-time reality. Transcendence is a magnificent thing. It's very healing to experience transcendence. It's very, it's very sane-making. It's very, it teaches us what and why we're here. But too much transcendence can be disorienting. Too much transcendence can actually make you lose contact with another great truth, and that is the truth of our embodied existence. I made a completely strong commitment to reestablishing my presence inside time and space. It took me about 10 years. I did it through conscious exercises and I did it through a sheer commitment to live as I was, where I was for the, my remaining years in this earth. And it took me about, about 10 years to really get solidly grounded and operational on the earth. I will say at the same time that I've learned to manage my memories of transcendence, my memories of communion, but they're always there in the back of my mind. They always guide me in the, in the larger trajectory of my life. 
Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this uh, amazing uh, experience that uh, you have. I, I'm uh, from Israel. Mm -hmm. I w wanted to ask two questions. First of all, uh, about uh, when you say a high dose, uh, what is what is uh, what ah. are the doses that you are talking about? Yeah. Uh, I was working. And also, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. And the second question I wanted to ask about all this, all the setting, you know, what was the setting? Because, you know, I, I consume, I do a lot of work with, with, the, mm -hmm. with plants. And it was very interesting to know about the setting. How was the setting of the, of the, of, of, of it, of the, of the journeys? How you did it, how you prepared yourself, how you did, what was in the moment, if you were sitting, if you're lying, you eyes closed, music, no yeah. music, nature. All of yeah. these things, and uh, I would like to know about uh, this and about uh, also about how you were in the daily life. What kind of things helped you to to stay here in a good way? Like what spiritual practices or exercise or food or yeah. something that was. Thank you very much. Yeah, good questions. Thank you. Uh, I worked at 500 to 600 micrograms, which is very high doses of LSD. Um, and I mean, low dose psychedelic work may be one, 200 micrograms. This was very high levels. Uh, my setting, I was always working in complete privacy and inside. I was either in my own house or at my wife's uh, professional office. I was always lying down. I was basically, if you, if you look at Stan's book, LSD Psychotherapy, you'll get the protocol laid out in great detail. Music was very carefully curated to, to pace the stages of the opening and closing of the session. Always wearing eye shades. Um, not really, the only way my sitter would be in communication with me was primarily through the music. She took care of my body and took care of the music. And uh, so I was not in nature. Uh, hmm, what was the other part of your, oh, the grounding practices. Um, really important. Uh, you have to maintain grounding is, is a dynamic balance. Uh, my life was very kind of grounded in a schedule in reality. First of all, it was grounded in relationships. It was grounded in a long marriage. My first wife, 24 year marriage. It was grounded in my roles and responsibility as a father. I have three children. So wherever I was on Monday, uh, I was on Saturday, I was back in the classroom on Monday and I was taking care of my children uh, on Sunday morning. Uh, in my teaching, I had a, a rhythmic, a constant set of responsibilities that kept me always on track, always kind of, I always grounded in my responsibilities of teaching my students. Uh, I was always doing spiritual practice. I was always doing a form of meditation. I did different types of meditation over the years, but I was always meditating. Took care of my body, doing yoga, various physical practices. It's really important to stay in lively contact with one's physical world while doing this work. So basically, we're just blowing consciousness out to its farthest limits, and then it spontaneously recongeals and I found that myself, I had a seemingly uh, a natural capacity, an easy capacity. Jessica can no doubt explain in my chart the markers of that. Uh, yeah. a, a capacity to let loose and let go of boundaries and then to recongeal back into my time-space reality. Yeah. Does that cover your questions enough? Okay. Ah, yes, that uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. So I uh, just the last question, just to confirm this, you always made sure, let's say, there will be someone uh, like in a distance or in a house or somewhere that if you need you need assistance or yeah, like you always yeah. uh, you you make sure that they nobody will be there. Yes, am I is my mic on? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I was never left alone. I was always taken care of. Uh, my wife was my sitter. She's a clinical psychologist. Uh, my first wife, Carol, 
Uh, she was my sitter. Uh, she never left me alone, and she she had complete responsibility for taking care of our world. We were always isolated. We were in private. There were no interruptions to my work. When I basically closed the door and we entered this world, uh, there was absolutely nothing that was going to intrude from the outside world. I think that's really important. It's, it's important to have an absolute clear container. I call it entering the kiva. Just as in, in the southwestern United States, when they would do spiritual practice, they crawl into the kiva, a hole in the ground, they pull up the ladder, and you're isolated completely from the world while you're doing this work. If you're going to go deep into the universe, it's very, very important to have a completely grounded, isolated, protected environment so that you know that whatever you're confronting, and I've confronted some pretty horrendously difficult experiences, but whatever you're confronting, you know that it's not coming from outside you. It's coming from, in a sense, from inside you or from in, it's coming from the universe, but purely through your own consciousness. So no outside complications. I did not try to stay in contact with the outside world at all. Let's hear from Carrie. Go ahead, Carrie. Hi, everybody. Chris, I just want to Carrie? say thank you so much for all your work. I've heard you speak years ago through PCC and CIS and mm. uh, have enjoyed your writings and, and many bits. But I loved this presentation that you did today, so coherent and walking through each of the stages and sessions and the way you organized the arc of the journey is really impressive and super rich. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, three questions. You can pick one if you want, if it seems okay. too long. Um, but the, the astrological inter integration, I'm really curious about, um, you know, your individual chart, your transits, um, mm -hmm. how the individual chart kind of functioned as a lens for you to entering these, you know, either, uh, subconscious parts of yourself to be able to see them or the, you know, the collective unconscious as well, all of the parts mm -hmm. there. And, and, you know, how much of the, of the chart do you think remained as you entered these less individuated states? Yeah. So the one, the individual part to the transits, any, you know, just any little headbits that stick out, I guess. And then the okay. third one, I'm really curious, particularly it came up for me when you were talking about being in the ocean of uh, suffering and the, the healing that can come about um, from processing that internally and individually. And I'm curious if, you've, if those effects, you felt them in your, I'm just gonna call it your waking life, uh, your, yeah. your normal states of consciousness in, if it kind of came back from people around you or in world events yeah. or um, yeah. in any potent moments where that, where that you really felt that reflection of your internal experience yeah. from the external world. Yeah. Let's start on your last question and then work forward into the earlier ones. Uh, yeah, it did manifest. There were manifestations that emerged in the outer world. And so let me mention my book, The Living Classroom. And there's a chapter on teaching in Dark Night Early Dawn. What, my, I never talk to my students about my work, right? I just made a firewall between my professional life and my inner shamanic work. Uh, and yet I found over time that various students were being activated by my inner work. The, that the deeper I went, the more powerful this activation became. And it became such a prominent part of my teaching that I found that I had to, I had to understand what was going on. I had to learn how to work with these forces. Uh, so for me, integration doesn't mean simply personal integration into my personal life, but it also means helping take care of all the derivative social fallout of one's own experiences. I found, for example, that while I was teaching, and I would just be reaching to give examples of something I was trying to explain, that the examples that I would reach for would, without my even being aware of it, students were coming up after class and they say, you know, it's interesting that you use that example because that's exactly what happened to me this week. And this happened over and over again, that there was some kind of boundary which had come down between my mind and my student's mind. It was, and not only, not only were these things kind of like triggering sort of an aha moment for my students, isn't that curious, you know, but the deeper I went, 
the more these synchronistic touches began to trigger very, very deep healing experiences in the students. It was as if their souls were in communication with my soul and they were giving me bits and pieces of insights into where they were, what they needed, where they were suffering, where they were hurting. Uh, and this was happening without me being consciously aware of the process at all. And so I really had to study this. I really had to understand what was, what was driving these processes. And eventually I wrote, after Dark Night Early Dawn, I wrote an entire book on the living classroom, on the collective dynamics in the classroom. And I don't mention psychedelics there because this is not a psychedelic phenomenon. This is simply about the nature of consciousness. At one level, we have private mind, but just beneath our private mind, mind does not have privacy. There are collective dimensions of mind. It's like throwing a, a rock into a lake, the ripples spread out. When you do deep, deep work, the ripples of that work spread out and touch the lives of people around you. The place where I experienced this most profoundly was in my classroom because I was working in a collective context. I could see these ripples coming back at me all the time. Uh, the first, the, the, the issue of astrology and uh, individual and global transits, this is a complicated question. And I'm not an astrologer, so I wanna be very careful about this. I tracked my sessions. I used astrology to plan my sessions after I'd learned from Rick Tarnas about the correlations between outer planets and inner experience in psychedelic days. So I, I planned my sessions by transits, and I also tracked the patterns of my breakthroughs projected against the pattern of the planets. And I found it to be a very complicated correlation. While there were correlations between my individual transits and global transits with the unfolding of my psychedelic experience, there were also differences that I wasn't expecting. There was a kind of a, a failure to find correspondence. For example, my breakthroughs were not always paired with, with Uranus. All right. My, my really, really intense up against the wall, uh, death in your face experiences were not accompanied, were not marked by Saturn transits or Saturn global transits or even Pluto transits. And so it was a complicated process. When, when my work began to go off the edge of time and space, when I began to enter deeper and deeper into archetypal reality and then beyond archetypal reality into Dharmakaya or the diamond luminosity, I found what I felt was a kind of a roll off of astrological variables. That the astrology did not seem, my, my psychedelic dance did not seem to map very easily into the astrological dance. And I began to think that there actually might be a roll off effect of one's solar dance and one's session experiences. And this continues to be an area of active dialogue for me. It's an active consideration. There is an appendix in the book, the last appendix is called uh, Pushing the Limits of Astrological Correspondence. And in that chapter, in that appendix, I give the dates of all of my sessions. So if one wanted to, one can look at my natal chart, one can look at the sessions, one can look at the correlations or lack of correlations and so forth. Now I know that that's not a, there's not enough sessions given in the book to really give a definitive answer, but I wanted to support the discussion of the relationship between uh, astrology, astrological transits and global transits and one's own psychedelic work. To me, that's an open question at this point. I know that there are correlations, particularly in the early stages of one work, whether those correlations continue to be as strong in the late stages of one's work, I'm not as convinced of. Okay. And in terms of my own chart, that's, that gets too complicated. I mean, I, I have a lot of Neptune in my chart. I have a lot of water in my chart. I have a sun squared Neptune with Neptune in the first house. 
So there are a lot of, I have some other dynamics that I was destined to do this type of work, you know. And I want to mention the ocean of suffering. This was not something that was forced on me. I didn't understand it at the time. But this, and I don't think the universe forces any of us into this type of work. This was too, too hard, too demanding, too difficult for to have it be forced on me. What I learned over time, again, is that this is something that I voluntarily took on in this incarnation. It was part of the plan of my incarnation to do this work and to do the ocean of suffering work in particular. So I'm a volunteer. And I think we're all, when we get into this deep, deep muck that we get into, we're volunteers for this work. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. Hi there. Hi, Chris. This is Paul and Amber in Poland, and uh, we uh, are so happy to finally see you live. And um, thank you. Um, wanted to say how much we appreciated your call. I have a few um, questions, but uh, let's start. Uh, let's continue the theme of the ocean of suffering. Um, where we live in Poland, of course, was the site of one of the most horrific. Um, uh, events that happened, I would say, for centuries, which by which I mean, of course, the Holocaust. Yeah. When you had your experience um, of the ocean of suffering, did you experience anything specific, or was there specific information or visions that you had that might have related to something like this? The reason I'm asking this question is because the event which happened 80 years ago is so palpable yeah. that it's still in the atmosphere, it's still in the collective, you can feel it here in the land. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's there in the collective, um, whether we like it or not, and I was just interested in whether in any of your sessions you actually uh, had a sense of what happened then? Yeah. I did not go into specifically identifiable historical traumas like the Holocaust. Um, what happened was I basically was taken into deeper and deeper and deeper into pain and fury and chaos and extraordinary suffering that kept getting larger and larger. It, it wasn't narrowly focused in any century or any country or any place. Uh, it, it expanded to include hundreds of thousands, millions of people, and it expanded to include hundreds of years, thousands of years, until eventually my subjective experience was that it included all the human beings and all the conflicts that had emerged in the history of humanity. I mean, something of that scope. So mm -hmm. I have no doubt that trauma like the Holocaust or trauma like the extinction of Native Americans and other tribal conflicts and so on, I have no doubt that those were implicitly present in what I was working with, but it, it wasn't explicitly present. It was like, to me, you know, Stan has this concept of a coex system, a system of condensed experience. I think the collective psyche also has these massive aggregate, these balls of collective experience. I call them uh, the, the meta matrices. They are, they are the, the meta coex systems, the coex systems of the collective psyche that fuse multiple historical periods and multiple cultures and multiple people's experience. Late in that whole series, it became very clear to me was that I, what I was engaging was memory, the living memory of trauma that was embedded in the collective psyche. Mm -hmm. I should mention that where I live in Youngstown, Ohio, Youngstown, Ohio we haven't had a Holocaust here, but we have a long history of violence. Uh, it goes back to the Native Americans, and there were some massacres that took place here. There is a tremendous influx of Eastern European. This is a town that made steel. Uh, there's, there's a lot of old world patriarchy, a lot of violence against women, a lot of old institutional violence. 
Uh, and the mafia took over our town for decades. Uh, there were gangland shootings uh, in neighborhood parking lots. Uh, my sense is that because the ocean of suffering was on the agenda in my work, that I was actually brought to a place where these poisons run close to the surface in the collective psyche. And I'm sure that if I were working in Poland or in a place that it would have been more explicit, the historical trauma that you're referring to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Chris, thanks so much for all your work over the, you. the decades. I've uh, been a huge fan forever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. And um, just so wonderful. And on this ocean of suffering issue that's been brought up and touched on, because that's kind of like the next stop on the journey for a lot of the people out there working. Uh, your book, Dark Night, Early Dawn, was extremely helpful uh, to Petra and I. We, we don't work with LSD. We work with a holotropic breath work, which is just mm -hmm. another technique in order mm -hmm. to connect with these things. And what we had noticed over the years was that there were individuals uh, who, under not predictable circumstances, began to contact what seemed to be this ocean of suffering. Yeah. It wasn't a past life, which happens often enough, but yeah. there was something big about it. And then we realized, my goodness, people need some clarity that this is not just their personal stuff that they're saddled with and have to carry around forever. They yeah. are, in a sense, volunteers. Yes. And so this was extremely useful. And some people in spiritual emergency that come to us began to realize, oh, so I was trying to solve the basic problem between men and women for the last 5,000 years. Okay, well, you know, I've got other things I've got to do today. <laughs> and so that I want to thank you very much for that. And it's clear now uh, how this new work will make more available to many more people, whatever techniques they work in, even with spontaneous experiences. And what we developed was using systemic constellation work, then mm. to do a constellation for the individual that is caught in this, that would say, okay, here's the representative for the part of the man-woman story that's mine, and here's a representative for the part of the man-woman story that, hmm, you know, that's a great big thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then to let this, this clarity, to simply let them settle into, wow, I do have work to do, we all have work to do, and there's something else going on that we're all involved mm -hmm. in, but I don't have to have it done by tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. And, and so I just want to thank you for the earlier work. Uh, I'm so glad to see this. Uh, the, thank all the powers that be that brought you uh, living, breathing, laughing, and loving uh, into this, yeah. especially uh, the tense time that we have now. So I'm looking forward to see if we get to the stage in our workshops in which the, um, uh, the, the comments about the other, <laughs> other stages of the path uh, become a, a similarly useful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I, I completely agree. And, and I think as we go deeper into this historical crisis that we've entered, I think we're entering into a collective dark night of the soul. It seems like uh, there is a profound detoxification taking place, that the poisons of history are coming out of our collective pores. I mean, we see it if we look around us in, in body politic, but it's coming out of our pores and it's coming up underneath us and flooding so that if, if we're interested in doing purifying work, if we're interested in doing transformational work, when we open, we open it, if we have a technique that's powerful enough, like holotropic breath work, we open at an individual level and then we open at these deeper levels. Now, I'm not a therapist, but if I were a therapist and if I were working with people entering these states, I think just what you're describing, differentiating different levels of the work that emerges, recognizing kind of what is mine personally and what is not mine personally, but mine collectively. It's important to have closure and to be able to close uh, these collective levels. And, and there would be, I would think, an importance of kind of winding those sessions down and kind of concretizing the collective work in contrast, in separate from one's individual work. Now, I will say that um, I 
went into this work voluntarily, I stayed into it voluntarily, and I'm infinitely glad for just personal reasons, let alone the collective reasons. I am personally very glad to have done this work uh, because the rewards that came were not simply a karmic paying back, but when one opens and embraces one's life as a member of the species, when one opens to the species and takes responsibility for the pain and suffering of the species, it sets in motion not only a healing of that species, but there is a tremendous infusion of light that enters into the collective psyche and into your psyche as it enters into the collective psyche. And so I have been so deeply rewarded, more than amply compensated for the work that I did in the ocean of suffering and other levels. And I think that this is true for other people too, that when we give deeply and generously to those around us, sooner or later, we don't know when, how, or where, but sooner or later, there is a, a deep fruition that comes up underneath us that carries us individually where the universe is intent on carrying the human species as a collective. And that is into this birth of this profoundly new quality of consciousness that I'm calling the diamond soul or the future human. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, as Carrie said, that was such a beautifully laid out, coherent arc. And I'm so grateful for the time that you have spent with us today and for all of you here connecting from all around the world. Thank you so much for uniting today in both our hearts and our minds. And we send each of you so much love and infinite blessings on your journey as you deepen into your own explorations and the healings that we're all here doing right now today in this world. Thank you so much, be well, and we will see you next time.